Hi, everyone, and welcome to part five of our talk about rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, and other uses for the complete graph. So really, we were using rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, and similar games to motivate looking at the complete graph. Now that we've looked at the complete graph and we've seen this idea of perfect one factorizations and this famous conjecture that thinks that perfect one factorizations should always exist for a complete graph of even order, now we're ready to take a look at why we might care. So as mathematicians, we normally care because there's a conjecture that's been tried, um, tried and tried to be proven for like more than 50 years, and that's um, interesting in, its, in and of itself. But in fact, perfect one factorizations of the complete graph also have a really useful application. So that also motivates the study of perfect one factorizations. And the application is called RAID. And RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, or sometimes in the literature it's referred to as inexpensive disks, but it means the same thing. And no, it doesn't have anything to do with killing bugs, so you can move away from that at, right away. What it has to do with is storing data. But we want to store data in a way where we don't just store it all onto one disk. Sometimes companies or um, universities or anybody might want to store information over several disks, and you want to might, uh, maybe do it in a way so that if you lose some of the disks, you still re retain your data, i.e. you can find your data again. So we're going to be storing data blocks, and we're also going to be storing parity blocks. We call them parity blocks, but really they're like check blocks. Think of them as things that aren't in, um, they're not information that we want per se, they're just there to help us retrieve data should we lose anything. So um, apparently this is like a RAID 5. This is a nice little picture, which shows some blocks of data in blue and some parity blocks in green. And basically, if you think about one of these disks failing, the reason why you'd be able to get your data back is that essentially you would look along one level. And I think the way it works here is that the sum of all of these things must equal zero modulo two. So if you lose one of these, you can easily recalculate what the piece was that went missing. So that's sort of how this works in general, but what I want to show you is how you can use P1Fs to make really cool systems of RAID where you can actually lose two disks and still retrieve all of your information. So I'm going to do this using an example, and the example is going to be a little bit small, so you're just going to have to um, imagine how you might generalize this. Think about a perfect one factorization of K8. Now, you don't need to immediately know what it is. I'll show it to you. What we're going to do is we're going to use it to build a RAID system with six disks. Okay, so the first thing to notice is that when I have K8, what I've really done is I've drawn my eight vertices with seven that go around the outside and one in the middle. And this is not an accident because what I'm going to do is I'm going to build up a perfect one factorization using that rotation technique that we saw in the last part. So if you haven't seen the, the part four of this talk, then you're going to have to go to that before you understand what this is doing. Now, why have I drawn seven and eight sort of in white instead of in black? I've drawn them like that because they're gonna have a special role in this. And so what we want to do is we want to think about the first one factor. So let's, over here I've said that GI is factor I without seven or eight. In order to understand that, let's look at an example. This that I've drawn in pink is factor number one. So the reason why I'm calling it factor number one is because it's the factor that has um, the one connected to the eight. So factor number two, factor two is going to be the one factor which connects the two to the eight. So here we have factor number one. What is G1? Well, G1 is simply going to be all the edges of this pink one factor, except ignore the pieces that involved a seven or an eight. Okay, that's fine. That just leaves us with this three, six and this four, five. So that's exactly what we say G1 is. By the way, it does not matter if I write 3, 6 or 6, 3. That um, doesn't matter at all. So as we go throughout the next few slides, if I write a 3, 6 or a 6, 3, it means exactly the same thing. Okay, now let's remember what our pink one factor looked like so that as we imagine rotating, we would get a dark blue one factor. It's arbitrary what color you choose, but in this case, I've chosen dark blue. Okay, we want to do the same thing. So G2 should be this thing without the edge that involves a seven or an eight. So those disappear and you get just 
one, three, and five, six. There they are. And you do this again, and you again it delete the edges that have an eight or a seven, and you'll get one, five, and two, four. And you do this one more time. Now you're at the fourth factor, and you delete the seven and the eight. You get these two edges, and you do this again for the fifth one factor, and you get these two edges. Finally, you look at the sixth one factor, the one that has a six, eight edge. You delete that edge as well as the edge that went with a seven, and you're left with two, three, and one, four. Okay, pretty straightforward. So we know that these things were built using one factors from a perfect one factorization. You need to, that'll be important, the fact that this came from a perfect one factorization. But for the moment, what we're going to do is we're going to look at these six colored bits and we're gonna see what that means in terms of how we should store data on six disks. So these are the bits that we've constructed so far. These are the G1, G2, up to G6. And what we want to say is that for every edge in one of our Gs, we wanna think of that edge as representing a piece of information. And not surprisingly, we're going to put that information on disk I. So here we have information which I've called B36, sort of to mean like block 36. And remember, 36 can be written as B36 or B63. It'll mean the same thing. So now we have these six disks storing these 12 pieces of information. Okay, fair enough. So we have some information and now we need some check blocks or parity blocks. Now, we could obviously, if we wanted to do something really silly, we could obviously copy a bunch of disks and make maybe 12 disks, and then if you lose a disk, you're fine, you still have your data. But we wanna do things in a better way. We wanna just have six disks, and then on every single one of these disks, we're only gonna store one other thing, and fascinatingly, that thing that we're going to store, we're gonna call BII, it'll just mean that it's a parity block, but BII is not ever going to be equal to a single piece of data. It's not like we're taking B24 and we're here. It's not like we're taking B24 and suddenly just copying B24 and storing it over here as B66. We're not doing that at all. No one of these parity blocks is equal to any given one of these. In fact, one of these parity blocks really comes from a sum of a bunch of these. And I'll tell you how to get that sum on the next slide. Okay, so if you're following so far, we have six disks, some information, 12 pieces of information stored on those disks, and then we know we wanna put some parity information on each of the disks, but so far we don't know how to do that. So here's what we have to do. In order to calculate what is B11, so in general, what is BII, but let's just look at B11, we're going to take the binary sum of all of the bits of information where we have a one involved. So in general, it's where you have a IX involved. So let's just take a look at B11. Okay, we look through all the disks and we find anywhere where we have a one. So here's B13, here's B15, B12, and B14. And now it might be interesting to note and important to note that B11 doesn't involve any calculation from disk one. Why is that? Well, if you remember how we built this stuff, this came, disk one is storing information that came from one factor number one. One factor number one had the edge from one to eight, but we removed that edge from one to eight. So there's definitely not gonna be anything involving a one in this pink disk. So we have B11 equal to this sum which involves stuff from other disks. Okay, so as long as you can see that we can do this for any one of these, I'll fill them in. There we go. Let's just say we've done all that work and we're at the last point. In fact, maybe we'll just double check. Let's look at the last one, B66, and we look through all of the pieces of information and we find anything that has a six, so three, six, five, six, two, six, and four, six. And that's what we add up here. Okay, so right now all we've done is we've decided a method for storing information. The information is stored like this on the disks and then each disk gets a parity as well. Remember that the parity is not a single piece of information, it's just the binary sum of a bunch of other information. So now we're going to be taking a look at what would happen if we lost some of our disks, in particular if we lost two of our disks. 
Now, remember that this stuff is all stored on six disks, but whoever built this structure knows the original perfect one factorization that they used. And in particular, they, they would have this drawing on hand. They would know exactly what they started with. So what we're going to do is imagine that disk one and disk six get lost. Maybe they're physically lost or maybe something happens so that the data is corrupted on those disks. For whatever reason, they're lost. So they just disappear and it looks as though they're gone forever. And without despairing, we're going to figure out how to retrieve the information that was on disk one and on disk six. All right, so get ready. This is where it gets a tiny bit tricky, but if you just follow along carefully, it'll all make sense. So we've lost disk one and six. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the graph that we have from our perfect one factorization and we're gonna say, okay, let's focus on the one factor that came from a one and a six. Now I remember that one factor number one is what I used with pink and number six I used green. So I'm gonna look at the graph formed by this G1 and this G6 over here. The reason why I've called this G1 and G6 is because that's really what was used for the data. And I remember also that these things came from one factorization. So really these dotted pink lines represent the edges that were belonging to the original one factor of this pink part. And the dotted green lines also belonged to the one factor of the original green. Okay, so we're at this point where we're looking at a graph where we know this is the stuff that we lost. And we think for a moment and we say, okay, hold on, this stuff in green and in pink really is just two one factors belonging to a perfect one factorization. So what does this graph form? If I just look at the edges that are green and pink, I don't care if they're dotted or not, just at this graph, what do I get? Hopefully you've answered Hamilton cycle because we have a perfect one factorization, which means that the pair of any two of the one factors must form a Hamilton cycle. And at the moment, it might not be super clear that it is a Hamilton cycle, but if you trace through, maybe here from one to eight, and then to six, and then to three, and then to two, and you keep going, you'll see you get a Hamilton cycle. So I'll just draw this in a little bit more concise way. I've just sort of untangled it, and now we can see it. It is definitely a Hamilton cycle. Okay, so how is this going to help us get our data back? Well, we notice one thing that's really important. There were six parity pieces of information, these parity blocks, and we've only lost two of them. We only lost B11 and we lost B66. So these things here like B22 might be useful for helping us out. In fact, if we were to look at this vertex number three at the moment, we would say, okay, hold on, B33 was not lost. So maybe we'll be able to use B33 to get some information. Well, B33 was calculated using any edge that involved a three. Okay, look at those edges. They are the edges that go from like one to three and from four to three and from five to three and also the edge from three to six and from three to two. But that's gonna be bad because three to six is unknown and three to two is unknown. So this is not helpful at the moment. But if you move down this path towards this last vertex of the path, we'll see something very nice. Look at number two. Vertex two belongs to the B22. Remember that the way B22 is calculated is given by all of the things that involved a two. Well, think about what involves a two. Everything that was involving a two was B21, B23, B24, and B26. Why is it that B27 wasn't involved? Well, it's because that's something that was a dotted edge. It was one of the things that was removed. So now we can see that B22 only involves, like look at the whole thing that's in green and pink, solid. So th you're just looking at G1 union G6. And you look through this equation right here and you ask yourself, what is it that was involved in my G1 or my G6? And you say, ah, the only thing involved was this B23. Well, that's great because B22 wasn't lost and neither was any of these other three pieces of information. So you can calculate B23 now. So we've recovered B23. Now that we've recovered B23, we can move up one level and we can use B33 the way we wanted to before. 
When we look at B3, 3, it involves all of the edges that touched 3, and that included the B2, 3. And now we know what the B2, 3 is, so the only thing left that we don't know is the B3, 6, and we recover it. So that's great. And then you just do the exact same thing on the other side. So in general, this path here will be a very long path going from n minus 1 vertex sort of all the way up to vertex n. Remember that these things are dotted, so you don't look at those. You just follow the path of solid lines. And then if you look at the other side, you can do the exact same thing. Working from b5, 5, you'll be able to calculate this 4, 5 and recover it. And then working up, you'll be able to recalculate 1, 4. And so now you've really recovered all of the information from data disk 1 and data disk 6. And if you're wondering, oh no, how do I calculate the parity again? Well, remember that all of these parities were calculated only from the information blocks. So once you've retrieved the information, it's super straightforward to just fill in what is the parity again. And now you're ready for any future data loss. Any two disks may be lost and you'll be able to recover the data. So I hope you were excited to see how this all works. I know that it's a little bit involved and sometimes it's a bit complicated, but if you go through the video a couple of times, hopefully you'll see exactly what I mean as we move through. Now, hopefully you'll join me next time for the final part of this fun talk on rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, and of course, other things to do with the complete graph. See you next time. Oh, you didn't even